If you like badge engineering, then this video is for you because I am driving a 1994 Ford Maverick. No, not that new pickup thing, this thing, but actually a Nissan. So how on earth did this come about? Well, hopefully um, you can hear me above the wind noise. Storm Dudley is um, still causing a bit of a furore up here in Yorkshire at the moment. But this is a Nissan Toronto 2 rebadged as a Ford. Ford's input was limited to sending some badges to Nissan and saying here's some money. The design of this car, the body, is actually by IDEA, the Italian styling house that was also responsible for cars like the Fiat Tipo and uh, I think the Fiat Idea, which would sort of make sense. And uh, I really like it. It's it, obviously taking a nod to the Land Rover Discovery with this sort of curved um, rear tailgate. There's a blatant ripoff of it. But uh, we got lights in the bumper because the European regs were going to say you weren't allowed to have the wheel block lights. And uh, But really a nice chunky shape. This is the long wheelbase five door, also available as a three door. In fact, I have owned a three door Ford Maverick with the 2.4 litre petrol engine. This is the 2.7 litre turbo diesel, which isn't intercooled and only has 100 brake horsepower. But yeah, I think it's a lovely bit of design actually, really chunky. It looks like a soft roader, but it isn't. When these cars were launched, soft roaders didn't really exist. Toyota was working on the RAV4, which introduced that whole market segment to us. 4x4s that looked chunky but weren't actually very good off-road. This is a proper off-roader, but uh, let's go and take a peek inside because it's um, it's freezing cold out here. Uh, I'll just unlock it. How retro is that? And uh, in we go. That's an aftermarket alarm system. Oh, yeah, it's rather raw out there, I, I must say. So we'll um, sit in here instead. So... Um, uh, there we go, Ford on the steering wheel as well, but it, this is all Nissan, Nissan Stork straight out of a Primera, a lot of the switch gear I recognise from the Primera too, but look, two gear levers, we've got proper four wheel drive here, we've got um, two high, which we're in at the moment, that's just rear wheel drive, four high, um, if you're driving in snow, but still fairly briskly, and then you can go, you have to push through neutral to get to four low, a proper low ratio gearbox. There is no center diff, so you can't use the four wheel drive system if grip is um, readily available, which sadly it is today. But uh, I'll try and post up some photos of my own Maverick in action. And uh, you can see that they really are extraordinarily good off road. Uh, limited slip rear diff means that even though the front wheels, which have no suspension travel at all for a four by four, are often dangling in the air, it would just keep going and drive through anything. And I think it was easily a match for a Land Rover Discovery. And it pains me a little to say that. I've always been a Discovery fan. But having owned both, having driven both on exactly the same terrain, uh, I think this, this vehicle would go anywhere a Discovery would go. Uh, the only limitation, as I say, is just up um, front axle. It, it's independent suspension by torsion bar. So uh, th there isn't actually that much suspension travel. There's quite a bit on the back. Back axles are just a solid... Uh, well, not solid, a live rear axle uh, on coil springs, and that does flex quite nicely. So this is the biggest difference to mine. This is the first time I've looked under the bonnet of one of these. Uh, turbo. And uh, there is the tiny turbo, but like I say, no intercooler. And about 100 brake horsepower from 2.7 litres, which is conservative at best. Uh, the Discovery, for example, was putting out, I think it was 111 brake horsepower from 2.5 litres. This one's been modified with all sorts of gubbins to have a second battery fitted because that aftermarket alarm apparently drains the battery and that ensures it will still start. Uh, but yeah, very simple. This engine in non-turbo form used in London taxis. Incredibly rugged engine. They go on absolutely forever. Let's have a peek in the boot. The door annoyingly opens the wrong way for UK roads. So if you're on the curb, um, how do you get in? You end up blocking your own access, but it is a big, wide opening door. Uh, it's got a parcel shelf that looks like someone's made themselves. That's quite a neat bit of kit. And we've got a luggage liner in here as well. And it's got the seat belts, which um, suggests it does actually have the extra seats. They don't seem to be in place at the moment, uh, but you could get this as a seven seater. Rear seat back is split 50-50, so not very comfortable if you're sitting in the middle of the back seat. But let's go and have a look at that next. Oh, because if I hop in, 
it's uh, it's just the right height. It's a nice height um, to climb in. It's not too high, but uh, good headroom, good leg room. Got some document pocket storage. This must be a high spec one. We've got electric windows, grab handles all over the place and see-through head restraints. Remember when they were a thing? So uh, yeah, your view here is actually quite commanding, quite good from the back. Here in the front, the uh, view is similarly commanding. You've got excellent large door mirrors and uh, a great view out um, over the bonnet, which is down there somewhere. A nice simple dashboard. We've got a headlamp wash button and that does work. I've already hit it by accident. Fog lights, nice proper indicator noise going on there. Heated rear window, very, very generic. Um, uh, Japanese heater controls. We've got some random buttons and some extra things that have been added by a previous owner. The story of the car is quite interesting in itself. It's only had two owners from new. Jim is the current owner and it was his friend who owned it before him and uh, bought it when it was like two days old, wax oiled it, really really looked after it. So it looks like a car that has covered no miles but if we take a look at the instrument binnacle it has actually covered over a hundred thousand miles. And so it's a credit to um, his care that it still looks so good. Sadly, said friend uh, passed away from cancer, but uh, it must be said, Jim was then um, inspired to go to the doctor about some concerns he had, and he has had successful cancer treatment. So it just goes to show, lads, we've got to do a bit of a better job of looking after ourselves and actually going to the doctor if we have some concerns. Uh, that so ends our little um, moral of this tale. But yeah, bo both of them have kept this car in just lovely original condition. It did have an aerial mount there because the previous owner liked his CB radios. But uh, otherwise, yeah, it's just a, an absolute credit to both of them. It's just lovely condition. But let's see what it's actually like to drive. There we go. Good thing about doing a bigger car is I can kind of give you a driver's eye view. So we'll uh, start the engine. Got the heater fan going already. Wait for the glow plugs. And uh, just turn that off a minute. It's a very agricultural diesel. And it, in fact, it just reminds me of um, uh, TX4, no FX4, sorry, taxis because it is the same engine uh, to all intents and purposes. Important wiper test. And it's a typical Nissan wiping performance. It's very good. Much of the screen is covered. Good overlap, no triangle of doom. Uh, yeah, a really excellent performance. I'll pop some lights on because it's just getting a bit gloomy and uh, we'll head off. Very notchy gear lever. Um, again, everything just feels properly agricultural and there's a reason for that. All right, we'll get out on the road and we can talk about the history of these vehicles. Very thankful to this pub because I've just blatantly used their car park for um, some filming. It's not an engine to rev. That's the full fearsome force of its power. And you hear it revving it just makes it noisy. It doesn't give you any power at all. It's a slogger of an engine which makes it a lot more relaxing than the 2.4 petrol, I can tell you that much. The 2.4 petrol needs all of the revs, especially if you're towing with it. It is not an engine known for its torque. But the Nissan Torano 2 that this effectively is, uh, uses the running gear pretty much of the first generation Nissan Torano. Now we didn't get that Torano in the UK, it was sold in other markets, uh, most notably in uh, America where it was sold as the Pathfinder, the first generation. And if you go and Google, or well, maybe even I'll put a pic up of a uh, Nissan Pathfinder or original Torano, it will look familiar to people in the UK because the front end is shared with the D21 pickup and that we did get. So effectively that first Torano was um, an estate car version of a pickup truck in much the same way as the Toyota Hilux Surf or Forerunner in some markets. And obviously the Americans themselves were up to that sort of thing. The GMC Blazer uh, or Chevy Blazer rather, based on a, a, a pickup. And so was the Ford Bronco of that sort of era. So America, very much the target market for this, um, for, for the original Torano. But the Torano 2 was geared very much more for European tastes. Uh, hence the interior is very car-like, even if the driving that dynamics aren't so much. Um, it actually rides 
really well and I think much better in this long wheelbase form, a little less choppy. But uh, you, th there's no um, getting away from the fact you're driving a big thing that's quite high up. It feels a little ponderous turning into bends. You almost turn the wheel and you have to wait for the body to catch up with the uh, wheels. It's a little 2CV like in that respect. So it, yeah, it, it's not a strong performer by any means, but that relaxing power delivery with none of the revs means it's actually quite relaxing to drive. Let's go this way. Because there are diggers. But you know, nonetheless, you can sort of get a reasonable turn of speed up. But I will say that the gearbox intrudes into the footwell quite significantly, and there isn't actually anywhere to rest your clutch foot, which is a bit unusual for a, a Japanese car. Maybe it was better in left hand drive. Because these cars were all built in Spain, even the Nissan Mistral which is another badge engineered version of this vehicle, only sold in on the Japanese market, nice mini clubman there, uh, that also was built in Spain and then um, actually exported to Japan. They did actually facelift these models after a few years and uh, actually upgraded the uh, turbo diesel as well. It finally gave it the intercooler it was desperate for and that helped boost power to 125 brake horsepower, which is a bit more reasonable. Then the Ford Nissan relationship came to an end and the next Ford Maverick was a Mazda Tribute instead. Uh, and that actually was a soft rotor, but Nissan persevered with the Toronto 2 and refined it further and uh, gave it the three litre engine from a Patrol in the end. I mean, it was still a four cylinder engine, so a big uh, old four banger and 150 brake horsepower. Yeah, by about two and a half thousand revs, this engine's done. Even though the red line actually goes on, it starts just after 4,000. There is no point going there. There is just, there doesn't seem to be any extra power. It's the, oh my gosh, you just pulled straight out in front of me. Thank you. It's just not brisk, but because you don't have to rev it, it's like driving a non-turbo diesel, if you see what I mean. I mean, there's no turbo lag, so you're not waiting for it to come on boost. I mean, you barely notice it come on boost, but that's just how they are. Old school, non-intercooled diesel. It's very, very gentle power delivery. I can just about hear the turbo having a bit of a whistle, but uh, it's only a little turbo and uh, I can't imagine it's doing an awful lot really. But then because it's a little turbo, it's not laggy. There just isn't any power, but nonetheless, we're making decent progress. See, you have to slog a bit going up some of the steeper hills, but uh, it's actually a really nice car to drive. It just, you find it odd to think people were buying these to do the school run and go shopping. And this, this, this was when the lifestyle vehicle really became a thing. And uh, Land Rover had been forced to respond with a discovery to cars like the Isuzu Trooper and Daihatsu 4-Track. You know, these vehicles, yes, they were being bought by um, people who needed a proper off-roader, but they were becoming incredibly popular with people who didn't want a proper off-roader. They just thought big, safe, secure, which was ironic because I think the short wheelbase version of these was actually a bit tippy-tippy. Yeah, we just leaned on, you can just feel it rolling. Exacerbated by being so high up. Now, sadly for Ford, this relationship didn't actually work too well. Uh, there were considerably more Toranos sold than Ford Mavericks. Uh, the Nissans came with a better warranty because it was just a standard Nissan warranty. And uh, I think the price was a little keener on the Nissans as well. Whereas I think Ford perhaps thought their badge meant they could charge a bit more. And of course it just doesn't feel like a Ford because it isn't a Ford. Not even a little bit. At least, you know, the other relationships Ford were having, like the one with Volkswagen, to have the Galaxy and Chiran. Uh, there, there was a bit, of, that was a bit more joint development. They each contributed engines, so it felt a bit more like a Ford. This doesn't feel like a Ford at all. It feels like a fraud. Ha <laughs> ha, I'm so funny. I will say, uh, the big problem with these was always rust. They rot horribly, so I'm glad 
the original owner did so much to protect this one. He, he really did save it effectively. So there we go, I finished this test at the National Coal Mining Museum, which seems a very impressive place, probably worth a look. Shame I haven't got time. But uh, yeah, that was the uh, Ford Maverick or Nissan Terrano 2, uh, depending on how you want to look at it. I've really enjoyed that. That's a, a cracking drive, a slow, steady, proper off-road, slightly agricultural drive, but yeah, very lovable nonetheless. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget you can head to the Hubnut store and buy lovely merchandise, and I'll see you in a future video. Farewell. Oh, we better do a rear wiper test. There we go. Look at that. Blade's a bit tired, but uh, quite a good wipe. And I like the hidden wiper down in that lower section of window.